And now to chapter 21, the wonderful world of amines. As with chapter 20, this chapter introduces numerous reactions that have already been covered previously in our text. In fact, there isn't a single reaction in this chapter that you haven't already seen before. So I, why am I wasting your time with it? Because repetition increases retention, focus improves depth, and amines are super duper important. During my first semester of graduate school many years ago, I had a beautiful and demoralizing experience with amines. What was that experience? Well, it was my very first cumulative exam, one of the first hurdles chemistry grad students have to traverse before receiving their PhDs. This particular exam had numerous questions about amines. Here are a few examples which you're welcome to look over and attempt later on for fun if you want. <clears throat> my first examining professor asked us to write out arrow pushing mechanisms for each of these reactions. In other words, this starting material is somehow converted into this product. And this starting material is somehow converted into this, into this product. Please draw the arrow pushing mechanism that shows how that is. Now as you look at these reactions, I hope it makes you think a little bit better about me, your professor. I do not ask you guys questions that are this mean. With my age and experience now, I could do these in my sleep, but back then I felt like a gerbil trying to perform brain surgery with a putty knife. For whatever reason, I found this question here to be particularly daunting. Once again, the examining professor asked us to provide an arrow pushing mechanism for the conversion of this starting material into this product. As with the previous examples, I was completely clueless. The professor then asked a follow-up question. Please identify the structure of byproduct X. For my first cumulative exam, I wanted to include at least one answer that wasn't completely ridiculous. One sign to my professor that I was an intelligent and redeemable grad student. What answer did I put to this question? This was my answer. I wrote down, it's a monkey, and I drew a picture of this monkey. Yeah, as you probably guessed, I failed that cumulative exam really hard. And while I didn't receive any credit for the answer, I could go home happy knowing that I had at least written down something that I thought was funny. Now, after studying this chapter, you should be able to provide IUPAC names for simple amines, be familiar with some pKa values of simple amines, know the amine reactions covered in this chapter, and be familiar with the heterocycles featured in sections 21.5 and 21.6, and with how they react, and then be able to apply this knowledge to total synthesis. We'll also cover some biologically relevant amines addressed in section 21.7. Let's begin by addressing the systematic naming of amines, with which you already have some familiarity. Amines, as you know, can either be primary, secondary, or tertiary, depending on how many carbons are bonded to the nitrogen. Thus, we could say that methylamine, where nitrogen is stuck to one carbon, is primary. Dipropylamine, this example, has a nitrogen stuck to two carbons, so it's secondary. Triethylamine has a nitrogen stuck to three carbons, so it's tertiary. Ammonia is the only example where you have a nitrogen that's not stuck to any carbons. When four carbons are bonded to the nitrogen, the nitrogen gets a positive charge. It's important to remember that that nitrogen still has a full octet. It only has a positive charge because it's sharing more electrons than a nitrogen typically likes to. When you have a positively charged nitrogen, that is a nitrogen that has four bonds, that compound is called a quaternary ammonium salt. Primary amines that have this generic formula are named by adding the suffix amine to the name of the organic substituent. Thus, for this example, we have a tert butyl group. I could call this primary amine tert butyl amine. Here I have a cyclohexane, but I have an amine coming off of it, so I could call it cyclohexyl amine. You could also call it cyclohexanamine. This example right here has two amines, so it's a diamine stuck to a butane, so I call it butane 1,4-diamine. The numbers are added to indicate which positions the nitrogens are stuck to. Symmetrical and secondary amines are named by adding di or tri to the alkyl group. 
Thus, if I've got a nitrogen stuck to two ethyl groups, for example, I would call it diethylamine. A nitrogen stuck to three ethyl groups would be called triethylamine. Asymmetric amines are named as N-substituted primary amines with the largest alkyl group being considered the parent chain. So let's look at this example here. The longest alkyl group that includes the nitrogen is this propyl group. If this nitrogen were not stuck to these two methyl groups, then the name of this compound would be called propylamine. So that is the parent group. Because this nitrogen is stuck to two alkyl groups, we call it N comma N dimethyl propylamine. The two Ns indicate that, the that these two methyls are stuck to the nitrogen. In this example at right, you can see that the longest chain is the cyclohexylamine. So that is the parent chain. And then you'll see that this nitrogen is stuck to a methyl and to an ethyl. We put those in the name alphabetically. So I thus name it by saying N ethyl N methyl cyclohexylamine. I'll now introduce you to the general amine pKa values by asking the following question. Which proton do you think would be more acidic, or that is, easier to remove, between compounds A and B? So I've got compound A that's completely neutral, and compound B where my nitrogen has been protonated uh, with one extra proton, so it's got a positive charge. Which of these two protons would you think would be more reactive or more acidic? Once you come up with your answer to that question, I want you to answer the question, why? If you wish, you can pause the video right now to answer this question for yourself before moving forward. Now, as you may have already surmised, the hydrogens on the protonated nitrogen in this ammonium salt are much more acidic than the hydrogens on the neutral nitrogen in the amine to the left. We therefore see the corresponding pKa's. The pKa of a regular primary amine is 40, and the pKa of an ammonium salt is 10. Remember that the lower the pKa, the more acidic the hydrogen. Thus, ammonium salts have more acidic hydrogens than typical primary amines. Let's examine the effect of electronegative withdrawal on amine pKa values. Can you answer me this? Which of these two compounds, or these three compounds, which be, would be the most acidic, and which would be the least? Now I'm going to answer this question. As you may have guessed, the least acidic one is this primary amine that is neutral. The most acidic ones are obviously going to be the nitrogens that are excessively protonated, making those hydrogens more easy to remove by a base. So the least acidic one is this methylamine. Now we have to look at these two acidic ammonium <coughs> salts and ask ourselves, which of these kinds of protons, the one on the left or the one on the, in the middle, are going to be easier to remove. As you might have guessed, when you have a nitrogen stuck to a benzene ring, a benzene ring is much more electronegative because you have an aromatic system of all sp2 hybridized carbons. Remember, you have more s character in an sp2 hybridized carbon, hence it's more electronegative. This benzene ring is much more electronegative than just this typical sp3 hybridized carbon uh, on this alkyl chain. So if I've got a benzene ring that's sucking electron density away from this nitrogen, it is going to make these hydrogens <laughs> much more acidic than the hydrogens that are stuck on this nitrogen on the primary ammonium group. Let's take a look at the pKa's to check this out. Thus I see that the least acidic compound of these three, once again, is the primary amine to the right because it's neutral. The most acidic with the lowest pKa is this anilinium ion here, the benzene ring stuck to an ammonium salt. And then the one that's right in the middle is this primary ammonium ion. And now to amine reactions, of which everyone here has already been taught to previously. If I treat a primary amine, like this methylamine here, with an alkyl halide, the lone pairs on the nitrogen can attack this carbon stuck to the bromine, kick off the bromide, and then this bromide, or another uh, base in solution can remove this proton to give me the neutral secondary amine. 
As we learned in chapter 17, amines also undergo analogous acylation if they are treated with an acid halide like the one shown here. Thus, if I have an amine and I treat it with an acid halide, the nitrogen comes into the carbonyl carbon, electrons go up and electrons go down and kick off the chloride. I have to have an excess of amine because the resulting positively charged nitrogen has a hydrogen on it that is not acidic enough to be removed by chloride. Thus, the excess amine has to act as the base to neutralize that amide product. For more explanation on that, please see pages 723 to 724 of your text. One of the major problems with alkylating ammonia, or even other primary amines, is that it's nearly impossible to stop them from over-alkylating. Thus, if I treat ammonia, or a primary or a secondary amine, with excess alkyl halide, I almost inevitably end up getting a mixture of primary, secondary, tertiary ammonium salts, as well as the quaternary ammonium salts. Now, I can neutralize these, but I end up getting, once again, a mixture of primary, secondary and tertiary amines as well as quaternary ammonium salts. This can be a problem if you're in a circumstance where you want to exclusively get one specific kind of amine, primary, secondary, tertiary, or exclusively get your ammonium salt. So how in the world can we deal with that? By using the Gabriel synthesis. So this pro uh, problem can be circumvented using the Gabriel synthesis. As we've talked about back in chapter 17, if I begin with this compound called thalamid, I have to use the PHTH sound there, it's kind of fun, thalamid, and I deprotonate it using hydroxide, the negative charge on the nitrogen can then be alkylated using an alkyl halide to give me this intermediate. If I take this intermediate, I can then hit it with acid and heat, and it will hydrolyze off the amine and give me a free protonated primary amine as my exclusive product together with this dicarboxylic acid. That protonated amine can of course be neutralized to give me primary amine as my exclusive product. There are other pro ways of uh, getting a primary amines as your exclusive products as well. If I take an alkyl halide like this and treat it with N3, that's uh, negatively charged azide, the azide comes in as a nucleophile, kicks off the bromide, and gives me this butyl or alkyl azide intermediate. If this is treated with hydrogen gas and palladium carbon, it's reduced to the primary amine exclusively. Similarly, if I want to take uh, an alkyl halide like this alkyl bromide and treat it with sodium cyanide, followed by acid quench, the cyanide comes in, does an SN2 displacement on this carbon, kicks off the bromide, and gives me this compound. Now this compound's a little bit different because this compound now has one carbon more in the carbon chain than the alkyl halide from which we started. If I take this nitrile intermediate and treat it with hydrogen ga gas and palladium carbon, it can then also be reduced to a primary amine. I want you to contrast these two methods. If I use this azide, to generate this azide intermediate, I get ultimately a primary amine that has the same number of carbons in the tether that was in that were present in my initial alkyl bromide. If, however, I use cyanide displacement, I end up getting a primary amine that has one carbon more in the chain than was uh, present in my initial alkyl bromide. Here are some other examples of reactions that you've seen. If I take a primary nitro group, like this nitroethane, treat it with hydrogen gas and palladium carbon, I can reduce that nitro all the way to a primary amine. Similarly, if I take a substituted or nitro-substituted benzene, like nitrobenzene, and treat it with hydrogen gas and palladium carbon, I can also reduce that NO2 all the way to an NH2. As you may recall from chapter 18, Reacting an aldehyde or a ketone with a primary amine and trace acid gives this type of compound called an imine. Doing the same reaction with a secondary amine like this gives you this type of compound called an enamine. I love the word enamine because once again it sounds like the Spanish word enemigo, which means enemy. Are you an amigo or an enemigo? Are you an amine or an enamine? 
As shown here, imines can be converted to primary amines by being treated with hydrogen gas and palladium carbon. Thus, if I take carbonyl compound, either an aldehyde or a ketone, treat it with a primary amine or ammonia, I get this imine, which can then be treated with hydrogen gas and palladium carbon to generate this primary amine exclusively as product. Similarly, I can take an aldehyde or ketone and treat it with an hydroxylamine and trace acid to generate this compound, which looks just like an imine, except it's got an OH attached to the nitrogen. This type of co compound is called an oxime. An oxime can also be treated with hydrogen gas and palladium carbon to generate a primary amine. Now this reaction sequence is called reductive amination, which we introduced to you back in chapter 18. You may recall from our chapter 18 video lecture that this reaction, reductive amination, has a humorous background story for me. Some time ago I worked as a postdoctoral researcher at Colorado. One of my fellow researchers told me about a former postdoc who approached him one day and said, hey, I just learned about the coolest reaction. It's called reductive emanation. Here was a guy who had a PhD in organic chemistry and had never heard of a reaction that we teach college sophomores. I suspect that he might have received his PhD from one of those coin-operated claw machines. Amide reactions should also look familiar to you. Thus, if I take an amide, like this primary amide shown here, and treat it with lithium aluminum hydride, which is the big guns, followed by water quench, I can reduce it all the way to a primary amine. You should remember, of course, that sodium borohydride is not strong enough to reduce amides. Hence, if you want to convert amides to amines, you have to use the big guns, lithium aluminum hydride. This reaction can also be used on secondary amides, like this one, to generate secondary amines as the exclusive product, and tertiary amides to generate tertiary amines as the exclusive product. To me, this seems like an excellent place for us to stop our video presentation. Please join me next time for my exciting concluding lecture on amines, the mental colonoscopy of the organic chemistry kingdom.